Greetings, Embers, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you would like to learn how to become a member of the channel or would like to buy me a coffee as a special thank you, those links can be found down below. Also, if you are new here and enjoy what you are hearing or you have been here and haven't done so already, please don't forget to subscribe, like, share, and comment. Not only does it help the channel out, but it also reminds you of every time I upload a video. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes, for once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab your snacks, or tuck in to get warm and prepare for this dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Trucker Stories. Right after this intro and ad will play, I'll read the first story and ad will play, and after that there will be no more ads within this video. I'm not a truck driver, but once I was driving through the Canadian Rockies late at night and had just passed through a small town. So I'm driving through the pitch black and I need to stop to pee and have a smoke. But because it's so dark, I missed the last rest stop for the next while. No problem. The highway is completely deserted. So I pull to the side of the road, have my pee while staring out at the dark, and then light up my cigarette and stand by my car. As I'm standing there, I see the figure of a man just walking out of the tree line. I'm miles from civilization patchy cell service, and there isn't a soul on the road. I thought my eyes were playing tricks on me, and maybe it was a deer, but nope, this was a man. So I calmly walk back to the driver's side door and I get in, locking the doors behind me. I'm keeping my eye on this guy as I nervously smoke and have my car and drive, ready to peel out. But for some reason, I just stayed put. The guy walks right to my passenger door and knocks on the window. I crack the window and I ask, what's up? He replies to me in a very, very serious tone. I need you to call the cops. I cautiously ask why and he tells me he had gone into the woods to kill himself, but he couldn't go through with it because he had thought of his daughters right before he was about to do it. I call the cops while the guy quietly cries outside. He had a kitchen knife that he was going to use on himself. So I stayed in the car and advised him to maybe leave the knife on the ground before the cops arrived. The cops came and got him, but before they left with him, I gave him a solid heart-to-heart -heart and wished him well. I still think about him. I hope he was able to turn things around. I'll keep this short and sweet, as it was my second encounter. My first was when I was five, morning kindergarten bus. I was at the mall, Crossgates. It's a pretty large place. I was 13 at the time. I'm 30 now, so quite some time ago. My mom was cashing out in Lord and Taylor, me being such a cool person wanting to hang in the car. My mom, after some coaxing, begrudgingly gave me the key to go sit in the car and listen to music. There were only a couple of people ahead of her in line. It was an easy evening, the sunlight still creeping behind the clouds, and the sky was warm, summertime. I walked to the car, and I felt... off. I couldn't hear a car behind me, but it's a parking lot, so... duh... It was a U-Haul box truck. They pulled up just in front of me. The back was open, which I thought was odd. It was empty. A man was in the back of the U-Haul. He asked me to show them. There were three men. Where Hooters was. Anyone familiar with this mall at the time knows perfectly well you can see Hooters from the lot I'm sitting at. Their bright orange sign it's Hooters. How could you miss the sign? I pointed in the direction, mentioning, you can see it from here. He asked me to get up in the truck. The box. The big, empty hole in the back. 
so I could show them where it was. I was kind of stuck. There were three of them. Why the hell would I get up in the back of a box truck? You can't even see the driver. Um, no thank you. But I was speechless. All my fears came back to me from my childhood. Out of nowhere, I could hear keys jingling behind me. Some man, an older man, probably 50s, came running up. He pretended he was my father and told them to get the hell out of there and that I'm his daughter, etc., etc. They drove off pretty quickly, not really listening to what he said. I still wonder. Thank you, Mr. Stranger, for looking out. I had three encounters total in my life. One at five, one at thirteen, and one in seventeen. Thankfully, nothing since. I'm a long-haul truck driver, so I'm no stranger to the States, and I've seen things that I can't explain. But this is by far the weirdest thing to ever happen to me. So, I was driving through Arizona, heading westbound on I-40. I had finally hit Flagstaff and got out at a truck stop and handled my business. As I left from Flagstaff, I ran my mile marker, 185. It's about 10 miles from Flagstaff, Arizona. As I passed mile marker 185, there was what seemed to be a person hitchhiking. The only problem was this guy was huge, like eight feet tall, looking stranger into a passenger window of my semi-truck. On top of that, it seemed to be as wide as the truck from shoulder to shoulder. I passed the hitchhiker at 70 miles per hour, or so I thought about half a mile down the road. I saw the same exact person, or thing. Once again, I passed it. But once again, this kept happening every 20 miles down the road to mile marker 165. I saw it every few miles after I passed mile marker 165. I didn't see it anymore, so I thought I was done with it. But I was dead wrong. I got down to mile marker I-45 and had to take a leak so I pulled over on the side of the road to handle my business. I was about halfway done when I heard an ear-piercing scream mix between what sounded like a deer and a human. As soon as I heard it, I started looking around, and just outside the halo of my headlights, I saw it. I was never more confused and scared in all my life. I tried to figure out what it was when I heard something flying through the air. Suddenly, I heard a thump, thump, and sitting three feet away from me was a huge rock the size of a basketball. It had to have been at least 80 pounds. That thing threw it at me, and it landed three feet away. I wasted no time trying to hop back in the truck and get away from whatever the hell that thing was. As I passed it, it just stared me down, and I never saw it again. Can someone please tell me what I saw? I worked for a company that owned a Caterpillar D9 bulldozer. It weighed over 100,000 pounds. They had to use a tractor from the 1980s with a drop trailer to move it off the property. Both were functional and as safe as they could be, but had seen better days. They asked me to deliver the bulldozer to another company, and I agreed. We loaded up the dozer, secured it into the trailer, and I was on my way. One of the intersections on this state route is notoriously bad. It's at the base of a hill, and if you're coming from the side, the hill is on. You don't see the stoplight or traffic until you get over the peak of the hill. 
you still usually have plenty of room to stop. As I was approaching this intersection, my CB antenna lit up, and a guy was basically screaming into it for traffic at the peak of this hill to slow down. The problem was that my CB wasn't tuned, and I only caught about every third word. I let off the accelerator when I peaked the hill, mostly because I hated that intersection. I would have had plenty of time to stop, even if the road conditions of traffic was normal. Unfortunately, traffic wasn't normal. There was a fresh, pretty bad accident at the intersection, and traffic had backed more than halfway up the hill. The accident had just occurred, so there was no emergency services on the scene. I now had a very little space to stop a very heavy load with a very old truck. I started downshifting and braking, realized I was going to be cutting it very close and started braking harder. Then I realized I was hitting large ice patches on the road. The tires were slipping and jerking the tractor around. I heard the fifth wheel clanking and I felt the trailer tugging on the tractor in a weird way. So I looked at my driver's side mirror and didn't see anything, including the dozer. In a panic, I whipped my head around to look out the passenger mirror and the only thing I saw was the entire side profile of the trailer and dozer. I had made a terrible mistake in letting that trailer get out from behind to me. It was one of those, well, this is it, this is how I die, moment. I was now jackknifing while still moving and still trying to slow the truck down while on an icy hill. I was headed for an intersection full of stopped passenger cars and my truck weighed a lot. By this point, I was thoroughly convinced that I was about to involuntarily murder a bunch of people. I laid on the horn as much as I could, but I was also trying to work the steering wheel in an attempt to pretend I had control. Honestly, I hit a point where I basically realized I was just a passenger standing on a brake pedal. I didn't have enough room to correct anything. So I just went all out on the horn. The trailer tires finally heated up enough to start making a very loud and deep squeal. There was a bunch of people in front of me that got out and ran away from their cars. They were basically staring at out of control death coming down the hill. The truck finally came to a stop within three feet of the last car in the intersection. I could sit on my truck's bumper and easily put my feet up on the car's bumper. The truck stopped with the trailer jackknifed, so I was blocking both lanes and the breakdown lane. I was sweating and was shaking from the anxiety. As I was sitting in the now stopped truck, the people who had abandoned their cars are now screaming at me and pointing up the hill. I looked up the hill to see another tractor, but a tank trailer, basically reliving everything I had just had, with much less space to work with, due to my trailer blocking so much of the road. I got out of my truck and ran away from it. The second truck slid down, stopped, and parallel parked almost perfectly with my truck. Once his truck stopped, I could see he was experiencing the same thing I was. We were both extremely close to being in bad accidents. Thankfully, he was pulling a dry tank. I am pretty sure that's the only reason he was able to stop. He was running much lighter than me. By this time, the guy on the CB got through to enough truckers at the top of the hill that they basically slowed everyone down. Once the adrenaline wore off, I almost passed out. I have operated a lot of different vehicles in my life, and that situation was easily the scariest operating situation I have ever lived. I had zero control of the situation, and that's a bad feeling for an operator. I remember the people that ran away from their cars were comforting me. It's been over 20 years since that happened, 
and I still get the willies when I think about it. Had I not been able to get that truck to stop, I would have ripped through all those passenger vehicles with little resistance. Another five miles per hour, or being in a different lane, just a bit more ice, even the time of day would have completely changed the outcome of that situation. It would have been entirely my fault, too. I service fire equipment, so I drive a box truck. I was in rural northwest Pennsylvania, returning from a service call and heading towards the interstate to go home. On the way to this customer, I saw a small pickup truck on the interstate whose right rear tire was steadily deflating. A mile or so before my exit, they pulled off to the side. I didn't stop to see if they needed help and felt a little bad about it. As I drove down this dark, twisty road, I passed a Dodge Durango that was pulled over into a barn driveway. There was a person lying on the ground behind it, struggling with something. It looked like the guy was trying to change a tire or get the spare tire out from under the Durango. Remembering the pickup from earlier, I decided to turn around and see if he needed help. I pulled into the first driveway I saw, about one-fourth of a mile down the road, turned around, and headed back. Halfway back, the Durango passed me, going the direction I had originally been headed. I got back to where I had seen the Durango, planning to turn around again. But as I swung into the driveway, my headlights caught a figure lying motionless in the snow. I stopped and jumped out just as the figure sat up. It was a woman, maybe in her forties, in a thin, torn black skirt and top. Her hair was mused. Her eyes were starting to swell. She had red marks on her throat and her lip was bleeding. I helped her up, got her into my truck and cranked up the heat. I had taken my jacket off so I gave it to her and she covered her torso and arms. She didn't want to say anything. Her throat was sore, and she was badly frightened. I called 911, and they dispatched a police car. I gave her a bottle of water, and she whispered, Thank you. Then sat with her head bowed and eyes closed. It took about 15 minutes for the police car to get there, and she stayed silent. As the car pulled in, she said, mostly to herself, He's gonna arrest me. The trooper walked up and motioned to me to exit, asked her if she needed an ambulance. She declined, then asked me what had happened. I explained what I had seen. He wrote everything down and then talked to her for a few minutes. He helped her out of the truck and into his car. She quietly thanked me for coming back because she thought that guy meant to kill her. As far as I know, she wasn't arrested. She was pretty beat up, and the trooper spoke and handled her as if she were the victim of an assault. It was almost certainly a transaction that had gone badly. I never found out what happened. I watched the news outlets for that area for a while, but never found anything. I was delivering and installing machines. Since I was behind schedule, I decided to drive late to my next destination. There were no street lights and no other cars. At the peak of feeling like I was in the middle of nowhere, every single light on the dashboard of the truck lit up, and then it stalled. Now it's pitch black. I am stopped and the truck isn't restarting. I shut everything down and started making phone calls. I looked up and saw something move in front of the truck, just out of the distance of my hazard lights. I finally got a hold of someone and they told me it would be between 
two to three hours before they could get a mechanic for me. So now, I am sitting in silence. The only noise is the clicking the hazard lights are making, and I am staring out of the windshield into a void of darkness when I see movement again. I threw on my high beams. The headlights caught the three wolves snacking on something that looked like roadkill. I honked the horn and they looked at me like they were irritated more than scared. The wolves more than likely weren't going to bother me, but it was spooky just knowing they were there, so I shut the lights off. I suddenly heard what I can only equate to a woman's scream of terror that sounded like it came from right behind the truck. Then something slammed into the side of my truck, hard enough to rock it. I turned every light on and laid on the horn. I was checking both mirrors and the only thing I saw was a shadow bolt across the road. I also noticed the wolves were gone. From every nature documentary I've watched, the only time predators leave food is when there are bigger predators around. I could hear it thrashing around in the bush nearby, breaking sticks and what sounded to be like logs. I basically had the steering wheel gripped, all the lights on, and was feverishly looking out the windows and through the mirrors to make sure nothing was around the immediate area of the truck. Finally, I saw some headlights through one of my mirrors. The noise stopped as the headlights approached. It was probably the mechanic. He pulled out in front of me. The headlights were shining on the back of his truck. As his door opened to step out, we both heard the scream again, and the brush thrashing intensified. His door immediately closed, and my phone rang. He called my phone asking me what it was. He sounded more panicked than me. I had no clue what it was, and he had no clue what it was. So the mechanic called the police. Two state police officers show up. They lit that area up like it was a stadium. I finally stepped out of the truck for the first time since this all started. We heard that scream three more times while the mechanic was working on my truck. Thankfully, they were getting further away. The cops had no clue what it was either. They were kind of spooked too. The mechanic finally got my truck running and I made it to my motel for the night. On the side of the truck that was hit, there was an indention about the size of a basketball, about seven feet off the ground. I have no idea what it was. I probably never will. I do confidently know that I will never, ever drive through the Upper Peninsula at night again. Something this way comes, and it happens to be barreling down the haunted highways driven by several truck drivers who shared these tales. Goldfield Hotel I drove Team Reno to Vegas to Reno five days a week. So, so many times while driving at night through Goldfield, Nevada, I would swear seven out of the ten trips for a year and a half, I'd see figures watching me drive by from different windows of the long-ago closed Goldfield hotel. I then saw a show saying it's very haunted. I got goosebumps at that TV show. The Creature of Tiger Mountain. It was in 1998. I was driving on Highway 18 over Tiger Mountain in Washington State at 2 a.m. I had my 11-year-old daughter with me. It was raining and dark. I was going about 30 miles per hour as I just got done pulling the hill. Had my brights on too. If anyone has ever been over Tiger Mountain going east towards I-90, there's a curve at the top before you start going down. My lights were shining at treeline along the road, 
and I saw a creature standing next to a tree, covered in hair, with thick hair around its face. And it was wild hair. He was looking straight at me, at eye level. I was in a new international, so a wild guess he was standing at least nine feet tall. My daughter's eyes were big, and she said, Do you see that, Dad? I said yes. It was a main topic all the way to Michigan. We concluded we did, in fact, see Bigfoot. You can believe it or not, but I definitely think they exist. Texting and driving. I was on the loop around Atlanta, Georgia, when a car started to drift over into my lane, so I started to drift myself. Then the truck that was in that lane started blowing his horn and talking to me on the CB radio. I told him that I couldn't slow down or speed up because there was a car under my tanker. He then gave me all the room I needed. As this dumbass came by me, I was able to look and see that he was texting and never knew that he was under my tank. Well, first of all, my name is Martin. I have been driving trucks since 2001. I live in El Paso, Texas, and I have seen most of the country from major interstates to back road highways. By now, I am a believer in ghosts and such phenomenon. Believe me, I live across from a cemetery that dates back to the late 1600s. Anyway, let's cut to the chase and make a long story short. Highway 191. You know the one that goes through the Four Corners, which is Navajo territory. One particular run I made going up to Salt Lake, I had to stop to take a leak, and I really didn't feel comfortable getting off the truck. But I didn't have a container or nothing like that, so I opened the passenger door, and I noticed like a flare of light coming from the back of the trailer. I really didn't want to walk back there, but I had to make sure nothing was on fire or anything of such. It was dead silent. Then, before I got to the back of the trailer, I began to hear what sounded like drums. You know, like Indians or something. Then I saw strange lights in the sky, which I have never seen before. I felt a very heavy presence, like someone was watching me from the canyons. Just a scary feeling overall. This was around midnight, very spooky and eerie feeling. Well, it didn't take long for me to run back to my truck and get a haulin. I even forgot to take a leak. That area is definitely roaming with spirits, perhaps of Navajo descendants. The Four Corners is very haunted. I have had other experiences with ghosts and stuff, but that is for another story. Drivers, be safe out there and beware. I can recall three places that really gave me the creeps. The second place was, and in all likelihood still is, just north of Georgia Highway 376, between U.S. Highways 41 and 129. I had to head up that way at about 1 a.m. one morning to get some bell peppers that had to be in Lakeland, Florida by 8 in the morning. I headed north on some country road off Georgia 376 to a T intersection. It was pitch dark except for my headlights. No town was nearby. The place was devoid of human activity. A graveyard loomed out of the dark on the left of the T intersection. And the sight of it on the periphery of the headlight suddenly gave me the creeps. I turned right at the tee and headed to the farm for the bell peppers. When I came back, I had to make a left, back south toward Georgia 376 at the graveyard intersection. I had the bright beams on. 
The headlight swung across the graveyard and lit it up. And I turned my eyes away from it because I had an eerie feeling about what I'd see if I looked. A big part of it was that I was the only person who'd see whatever it was I was afraid of seeing. Ghosts, devil worshippers, grave robbers, any manner of ne'er-do-wells frolicking in what seemed like such a foreboding place or whatever have you. The first place was also in Georgia, most likely on U.S. Highway 27, just south of Fort Oglethorpe in the far northwestern corner of the state. I was driving southbound late on the night of a full moon and suddenly found myself next to what must have been the Chikamawa Memorial Cemetery. Rows and rows of gravestones standing out in the moonlight, bright relief against the darker landscape. Thousands and thousands of souls who died violently in civil war battles, war battles of the war of northern aggression. I figured that if ghosts are real, they'd be in a place like that, and if they walked about, it'd be on the night of a full moon. I wanted to look because it was an awesome sight, but again, I didn't because I was afraid of what I'd see. The third place was also, you guessed it, in Georgia, Andersonville, on Georgia Highway 49. I drove by the place in broad daylight, not knowing what had happened at the place, and again, figuring that if restless souls, remnant of agonizing deaths, still roam the earth, that's where they'd be. I still get the creeps just driving by it. Truck drivers get treated to thousands of memorial sites, too numerous to even begin mentioning. As well, I'm a curious fellow by nature. But some sites seem like gateways to dark, bottomless mysteries in which a trucker can get lost if he or she peers too hard at them to see whatever it is he or she might see. Once upon a time, I was fascinated by such mysteries. But the real, conscious life is scary enough. I needn't any longer bother with the mysterious unknown that titillates what primal terrors lurk in my own subconscious. When that which both frightens and beckons rears its ethereal face before me, I just keep my eyes on the road and drive on by. We live and we learn, I guess. A man eventually outgrows the thrill of scaring the heck out of himself. I would love to hear if any other truckers have ever noticed a weird sort of spooky occurrence that has happened to me three times. It was a curvy piece of US 395 in West California, around Walker and Devil's Gate area. The first time it happened was about 25 years ago. The first time it fascinated and confounded me. The second time I was stunned in disbelief. The third time it happened, I was amazed and perplexed because nothing about it made sense, but I seen it with my own eyes. I have not had that same scenario happen again since the third time, but I wonder constantly what the story could be behind this mystery. It was cold, it was blowing snow, and visibility was not the best, so I used it as a good excuse to pull over. I was southbound on US 395 out of Reno. I had spent a lot of time getting loaded and getting out of traffic, so it was pretty late. I was determined to make it past the California line to avoid traffic the next morning. I did. However, there are not a lot of places to park on the California side that looked like I would be able to get out of easily if the snow was worse in the morning. So I was happy to see a wide spot on the west side that suited my purposes. There was a large pile of gravel in the middle of this spot, and I was careful to get past it in a way I could not get blocked in by other trucks. It 
was seriously really gold. As I surveyed the scene in my rearview mirror, I noticed a young lady with a small child bent into the wind walking towards the pile of gravel. I was alarmed that there was anybody out in this weather, let alone with a tiny child. It looked like they were going to use the gravel pile for shelter, I think. By the time they were out of sight behind the gravel pile, I had my heavy coat on and was getting my hat on. I looked and could no longer see them, so I jumped out of the cab and made my way to the gravel pile to see if I could get them in my truck to warm up a while. There was no one there. No one at all. I even looked for tracks thinking they went into the hills next to us. No tracks at all. In the early morning light, I was sitting there in the same spot deciding if I should put chains on when, out of the corner of my eye, I saw them again. Same lady holding the hand of a small child bent against the wind. This time, I was adamant about trying to help them if I could. I jumped out of the truck and ran back to the gravel pile, but there was no trace of them. Just like the night before, they did not even leave a footprint. I went on with my trip. It was several years later. I had mostly forgotten about this when I found myself in the same scenario in the same place. I had pulled into this pull-off spot that was unchanged over the years. It was late at night and I didn't even recognize it until morning. In the morning, I had to get out to adjust my chains before I continued. As I sat gazing at the blowing snow trying hard to come up with a reason not to get out and adjust my chains, I saw that same lady with the child walking the same way towards the pile of gravel. Yes, I jumped out again. No, she was not there again. No, there were no tracks again. That has been approximately 10 years ago. Spooky. My name is Adrian, and I've been a company driver for about nine years now. Back in late October of 2008, I was hauling bottled water from Seattle to a customer near Los Angeles when a series of frightening events began that would span a period of about four weeks, quite literally scaring the hell out of me. I have photos to prove that the following story is true. I was somewhere south of Medford, Oregon, when it began. Broad daylight and clear weather, although I don't remember if it was cloudy or not. I do remember being in a foul mood, however, because October of 2008 had marked the 10th anniversary of losing my young wife, Elena, to cancer. A milestone that, in hindsight, had brought up some deep resentment lurking below the surface for the last decade. In fact, I suppose I had been in a foul mood and at war with God for years. Anyway, I was southbound on Interstate 5 when I happened to glance at the GPS on my dash just in time to catch the altimeter reading exactly 666 miles above sea level. A small thrill went through me a thing that number tends to do, but I shrugged it off and kept driving. A few minutes later, I reached for the driver tech again to check an upcoming message and just happened to catch the countdown odometer as the display informed me I was exactly 666 miles from my customer. This time, I felt a chill creep up the back of my neck, but... Once again, I dismissed it as a coincidence. I was sensitized now, like when you buy a new car and suddenly see your make and model everywhere. They were always there. It's just that now you're turned into them, whereas you had no reason to pay attention before. A little creeped out, but not worried. I kept on driving. 
Later that same day, I stopped at the TA truck stop in Willer Ridge for dinner, just before heading up through Tejon Pass, but had another shock when my Burger King order rang up at $6.66. I would later fish the receipt out of the trash to take a cell photo of it and prove the story to my family because this was only the beginning. When I fueled at the Flying J in Fraser Park, just a half hour away, the pump clicked off by itself at 66.6 gallons. Right after delivering this load, I picked up a local run going to a customer in Carson. As is my custom, I had zeroed out my trip odometer before leaving, and as I pulled up to the guard shack, I was almost afraid to look at the trip odometer. Sure enough, it read exactly. 66.6 miles. Now I was starting to panic. For the next several days, the number 666 appeared everywhere before me, multiple times a day, sometimes within seconds of each other. So fast and furious that there was no possible way to dismiss this as hypervigilance or coincidence. For example, as I backed into the only parking space left at the pilot truck stop in Salt Lake City, my headlights fell across the hood of the truck in the space facing mine, and the truck number, of course, was 666. I searched for an empty trailer at our drop lot in Reno, but the only one I could find ended in 666. I stopped again at a pilot to fuel, only to see that the license plate of the trailer in front of me had the number 666. This went on for days, coming at me from everywhere. On text messages, software downloads, receipts, cargo labels, customer addresses, billboards, BOLs, street signs, fuel pumps, store displays, graffiti, multiple times on my driver tech display. Again and again, it just kept coming, relentlessly, for a whole solid two weeks. I finally started keeping my cell phone camera queued up and ready, because no one was going to believe this was happening. Most of the pictures I took were useless, either too dark, too blurry, or the image had passed before I could activate the camera. But I did not manage to get about a half dozen clear pictures so that my family wouldn't think I had gone nuts. One of the last photos was taken after I pulled into the Walmart DC south of Albuquerque, while 666 Los Motos Road was beaming forth from the address bar of my GPS display. It was terrifying. I tried to understand how this was happening, tried to come up with some rational explanation that didn't involve my worst fear that my internal war with God was finished, and he had handed me over permanently to the enemy of our soul. Now, before you write this off as goofy, consider that just before this all started, I pretty much had a complete meltdown on the road. As I said, ten years earlier, my wife, Elena, had passed away after an 18-month battle with colon cancer. She was unusually young for this type of cancer, barely 29 when diagnosed. But she put up a good fight before passing away, just a month shy of our 10th anniversary. I was left to raise our 8-year-old son, and like I said, became very angry at God. As I look back now, this rage had simmered below the surface for years afterwards slowly destroying my finances, my relationships, and tanking my restaurant business until I was forced to take up truck driving to save our home from foreclosure. I guess I didn't realize just how angry I was until I found myself, a decade later, hurtling down Interstate 5, crying so hard and screaming at my windshield with such fury that I could barely see the road. I was challenging God and cursing Him with such rage that I finally said something so vile 
I actually scared myself and shut up. I knew I had crossed the line and I instantly regretted it. Later that same day, all this started. One more thing, which I only discovered as I was writing this essay. The TA truck stop with the Burger King receipt is on the corner of Wheeler Ridge and Santa Elena Drive. It might be nothing, but go figure. Two weeks into this, and I had had enough. I was parked and waiting for a dispatch in a dirt lot just west of Bakersfield. When I took time to kneel in my bunk and ask God to forgive me for my outrage and blasphemy, I believe he did. And that very day, I felt there was peace between us again. The story of how that recollection came about and what happened afterwards would fill several more pages, but I'll save that for another essay. Suffice it to say that I went nowhere for a while. Work mysteriously dried up, and I sat in that parking lot for almost two days with plenty of time and no excuse not to open my Bible and have God show me a few things I needed to remember. Just as suddenly as it had begun, the incident abruptly came to a stop the first week of November. And that's where this story would have ended had something else not happened. A few weeks later, around the end of November 2008, it suddenly started up again. At least one of my photos came from that second episode because I thought, here we go again. But two days later, it abruptly stopped once more, this time for good. This confused me. I posted a video a few years later on YouTube describing these events and was soon contacted by a gentleman named Steve Seiler who asked if I would be willing to do a telephone interview for his online radio program. He was apparently researching a whole slew of reports of similar phenomenon involving the number 666 being experienced by others as well, but was convinced it was related to the November 2008 elections. In my video, I'd begun to reflect on world events since my experience and wondered out loud if there wasn't a deeper meaning to the timing of these episodes that transcended my personal outburst at God, but I couldn't be sure. I still have the audio recording of that interview, although the sound quality is poor and the interviewer edited out my last few comments, either because of time or perhaps because of my speculations didn't quite line up with his expectations. But again, that's a story best left for a much longer essay. Anyway, in hindsight, I'm ashamed of my selfish behavior. If anyone had cause to be angry with God, it should have been my wife, not me. But if she ever doubted him, she never showed it outwardly. The only disappointment I ever heard her utter was sadness at not being able to watch our son grow up. But even then, she made me promise to marry a good Christian woman who would love him as much as she did. I know now that God understands our grief and gives us room to question him as long as we obey the scripture that says, be angry, but do not sin. Compared to her, I felt that test big time. Still, it's reassuring to know that, despite being disciplined in this realm, Christians can take comfort in the knowledge that when we finally stand before our Creator, it will be as sons and daughters before a loving father, not as enemy combatants before an eternal judge. With that assurance, we have reason to face our inevitable passing with more peace than others who have no such hope. My wife certainly knew this, drawing ever closer to her Savior, Jesus Christ, as her days came to an end, and impressing everyone with the courageous way she faced her death with such grace and dignity. Had I thought deeper on it, I would have seen that my outburst was not only selfish, but ungrateful. 
Elena's strength should have inspired me to remember to trust God, no matter what. After all, my son and I were alone for only a short time before God honored her request, sending that good, godly woman she hoped for into my life to fill the void. I met Mary in an unusual way that I can only describe as having been orchestrated entirely by God himself, and we married soon after. Mary admits to being intimidated at first, but she humbly stepped into some big shoes and filled them very, very well, helping to raise Nicholas as if he were her own. But that wasn't enough. God apparently likes to stuff his gift boxes with extra goodies, and Mary wasn't alone when I met her. Nick instantly became big brother to three beautiful little girls, Christina, Priscilla, and Ariana, who have since grown into three lovely and sweet young ladies. But God wasn't finished, because he soon had a big brother too. At our wedding was my oldest son, Richard, who had been estranged from me until Elena, on her deathbed, encouraged me to make peace with his mother and reconnect with him. I had not seen him since infancy, but now I look at pictures of our wedding and see a smiling boy making goofy faces along with a crowd of happy kids, all of whom had grown into fine young adults, filling out my home and heart like I never could have imagined. We certainly had our ups and downs like any family, but the torch was passed and broken hearts were healed all over, which is fine because that's how he rolls. Enough said. And that, dear listeners, is where I have to bring a stop to these true trucker stories. I couldn't find that many, so I hope this will suffice. I'd like to take a moment and thank the reformed members of the channel. Inner Scare Wifey, Howler's Mom, Buzz Crispin, Tammy Slayton, C.A.G., Denise S., Samantha Place, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, Normie D.W., Chrissy Elias, Cindy Cleveland, and Patty's Niece. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. And if you are awake, I hope you've enjoyed these selections. In the meantime, please take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.